So case study number one is a guy that's presented with lower back pain, right lateral forefoot pain, and right calf muscular tendon disjunction strain. He's a laterally deviated subtalar joint axis, and if you look at the medial column of the right foot, there's hardly any weight on that arch, nor the first MTP joint. In fact, most of the weight was sitting on the fourth and fifth metatarsal head, pretty much sitting on that axis line. There was also a leg length inequality higher on the left side, a longer left leg. There was a sacral base obliquity high on the left in the frontal plane and a functional scoliosis to the right. On the right, there was an AS ilium or an anterior rotation of 15 degrees positive, which raises and externally rotates the acetabulum. Now on the left side, there was a posterior rotation or a PI ilium of six degrees positive, giving us an overall pelvic torsion of nine degrees. Now we know it's a bony difference because an AS ilium raises the acetabulum, a PI ilium lowers the acetabulum, yet he was still high on the left side. So let's try and pull some of these factors together with a supination resistance test, testing under the back of the arch, underneath the navicular and the front of the arch. A Hubscher manoeuvre is fairly easy on the left, but let's take a look at the right. Supination resistance test, incredibly easy and no weight at all underneath that first right MTP joint. So is this foot more prone to an ankle inversion sprain? Yes, of course, because the centre of mass is going to drift to the short side and he has an AS ilium that we've already said raises and externally rotates the acetabulum. This is a test that I developed called a lateral heel excursion test. So what I'm looking for here is, is there weight on this heel? Is there tension in the muscular tendon this junction? Now if you look at the right side with the lateral heel excursion test, I can move that heel incredibly easy. So the muscular tendon this junction on the right is going to be tighter because the eccentric load ability of that calf to lift that heel to try and push the right side of the pelvis back to stabilize the center of mass is going to be greater. So the tension in that muscular tendon disjunction is going to be really overloaded. And that's possibly where that injury comes from. Again, remind ourselves of that long left leg. So this is a posterior view again of that uh, supination resistance test and Hubscher maneuver. Very, very easy on that right side. So the left side again, resupination test and Hubscher maneuver. It's fairly easy because the lateral deviated subtalar joint axes were much easier on that short leg. Lateral heel excursion test is weight bearing on the fat pad, but hardly any weight on the bone itself. And the calf muscular tendon disjunction, again, is showing you where it's going to be really tight. So a guy like this with this type of strain will be very focal right underneath my finger there where the skin's blanched. Again, left, not too bad. He could still have calf strains on that left side, but not because of the early heel lift. So the supination resistance test gives you an idea of what's going to happen in the gait cycle. As he goes through the gait cycle and he lands on his shorter leg, the knee's going to be more extended. If he's got the eccentric load strength in his calf, you'll often find that the calf will be a little bit bigger, but he's going to whip that heel up really easily. So I'm going to give you an example of how I would prescribe for this type of situation. There's no black and white when it comes to your prescription. It's down to patient feedback and your experience. Um, but he's got zero degrees of frontal plane correction on his left and one degree valgus on the right. He has a three mil heel raised and two mil extended into the forefoot. With a pore on arch fill with a slight valgus torque on the right side and a high heel cup. What am I trying to achieve with this prescription? I'm trying to reduce that AS ilium on the right and that will stabilize the ankle and make it more plantar grade. But, and I would put him in this situation for about three months. I'm going to aim for this prescription, which we will be to get into about a four mil heel raise with two mil into the forefoot, maintaining the arch fill and the high heel cut. But ultimately, in terms of frontal plane correction at the heel, I'm not a massive fan of routine mechanics. It has its place but it has to only have its place. You have to prescribe for the pelvis as well. So I've got zero and zero, and then I would review over time and see how he progresses. But remember, if you're using routine mechanics, you've got to tie it into the pelvis, otherwise you're gonna make that ankle worse. This is case study number two, a lady that presented with uh, chronic lower back pain over many years, right-sided levator scapulae muscle strain and activity-induced headaches. She's excessively pronated on both sides and has a medially deviated subtalar joint axis. Now what you can't tell from this particular image is that she was particularly loaded on that right forefoot. Now this is an interesting case because this is what I call a double femoral pathway. So a posterior rotation of the anonymous bones on both sides giving her an 8 degree pelvic torsion. From a minus 6 degrees on the left to a plus 2 degrees on the right. 
Now this is a great example of actually what you see isn't what you get because this lady is a long left leg. The sacral base is slightly high on the right, the clue being the scoliosis to the right. But that minus 6 degrees of PI ilium has dropped the PSIS on the left. Now we said that a double rotation backwards and a PI ilium drops and internally rotates the acetabulum. So when you look at the feet, they're maximally excessively pronated. Now the lateral heel excursion test on, test on the left, I could hardly move the left heel. An inversion test, I could hardly flick that ankle over because the measly deviated subtail joint axis. But when I come to the right side, that forefoot is completely loaded with a Hubscher manoeuvre very difficult to achieve. Now if I do a lateral heel excursion test on the right side, I can move the heel. So again, right side, eccentrically loading the calf muscle muscular tendinous junction, although she did have pain there because of that shorter right leg. Let's come to a PA view of the feet now. So resupination resistance test on the left. There's a great deal of resistance there. I could get a Hubscher maneuver. The lateral ankle inversion test, I can't move that ankle into inversion. If I come around to the right side and I do a uh, supination resistance test on the right, the rear foot's moving, fully loaded under the navicular and the forefoot, that forefoot is completely loaded. If I do a lateral ankle excursion test now to look at the weight, so where's that right calf muscle lifting that heel Yes, it is. So the strain in the muscular tendon disjunction is going to be great. So can I sense any strain or stress in that right gastrocellular complex at the muscular tendon disjunction? Yes, a little bit. And the left was a little bit looser and a little bit spongier, so there was definitely a little bit more tension there. I'm going to suggest a prescription for this lady. Again, there's no black and white, but this is how I would tackle this problem. So I've got three degrees of bilateral rear foot varus. I've got a four mil raise at the heel, extending two mil into the forefoot, a varus arch veil underneath a semi-flexible polypropylene shell of three mil thickness. Why? Because I want to decelerate the pronation and high heel cups. Now, if you look, I've asked the lab for an overall depth of three mil on the left, an overall depth of seven mil on the right, giving me the four mil raise. Why? Because there was also a forefoot equinus presence. Now, from my experience, leg length inequality, forefoot acquirements can create a lot of problems, especially with the posterior oblique slings and the uh, myofascia. So that's something we can maybe cover in future videos. So what's the takeaway message from this video? That is, don't look at the foot and lower limb in isolation. Try and consider the pelvis and look further up the kinetic chain to the centre of mass. Try and understand what type of leg length inequality it is, whether there's any pelvic adaptions and pelvic torsion, and try and prescribe holistically. Because just maybe some of those abnormal adaptions, some of those abnormal motion patterns that you're observing in your gait analysis, and some of the asymmetric overload might just be coming from pelvic mechanics.